decade ago, if you were driving down Highway 99, which is that flat zipper of road that just goes right down the heart of Central California, and you look to the side of the road, you would see this shack standing. And I remember the first time I saw it, I thought, geez, that's something that had been lifted out of the Mississippi Delta in the 1930s. You know, who lived there? Well, as I was driving, you looked a little closer, you'd see puffs of smoke coming out of the roof. And it wasn't someone who lived there, someone was still living here in the year 2002, 2003. So one day, myself and Matt Black, a photographer who, you know, is kind of a modern day Dorothea Lang, Walker Evans, we pulled off the side of the road, came up over the railroad tracks across this little dirt road here, across from this vineyard and we pulled up to this shack. It was in a little bit better shape then, but basically a tar paper shack. And as we walked up, we could see that there were rabbit furs that had been, that were hammered onto the, the wall. I remember knocking once, twice, and this place was on stilts. And the door creaked open, and there stood this black man who looked like he'd been lifted out of the Mississippi Delta, 1930s. He had a stutter. In fact, later he told us that he came west with a stutter, one state at a time. His name was James Dixon. He was 95, and he was living here, had lived here since the 40s. He was part of this migration of blacks who did something that no blacks in America, uh, kind, of, kind of went against the grain of the Great Migration. You know, that Great Migration went from south to the in northern industrial cities, and if it came west, it came to Oakland, San Francisco, and L.A. But there was a tribe of blacks, black Okies, from the south and southwest who wanted to retain the rural lifestyle. It was very important for them to feel the wind at night, to be out in places where no one bothered them, to be close to the land. And about 25, 30,000 of them didn't go to the industrial cities. They went from rural to rural. They followed the cotton trail west. And James Dixon was one of them. He was from Louisiana. He worked in the, uh, in the railroads for a while as a porter. When I met him, he was, he had a little water pump here and a little pecan tree, and he was cutting down the pecan tree to burn fire to keep himself warm. He was five foot five, sleeping on a little iron crate. The iron crate was too small for him, so he had a, a wooden beekeeper's box for his head. Um, there were, I remember, I remember looking inside and there were Vienna sausage cans, empty ones that he was, that he had put in the crevices to keep the place from falling. I mean, literally he was living, you know, chickens have a better roost than, than he did. And this is where he was living. He'd come and I, you know, we found him a half a century later. And he was nervous. He, he thought we were government workers here to maybe inspect the house, shut it down, whatever. I told him, no, we we're here to tell his story. We're standing in the old Tulare Lake Basin. It was uh, the biggest body of fresh water west of the Mississippi. 800 square miles of lake right here in the middle of California. And these cotton growers from the south, they were chased out by the boll weevil, came west and uh, they claim this land, this, this, this uh, lake land, and they took the rivers and dammed them and shunted that flow to places where they wanted to grow cotton. And at some point they had to go by, back and find labor. And a number of folks came through the Tulare Lake Basin and, and their narratives played out here white Okies, Latinos, and then black Okies. No one had ever written about black Okies. They came in the 40s when the cotton picker was just starting in the fields. It was clunky and big and it couldn't, it could take the middle swath of the fields in the 40s and 50s, but it could not pick the edge of the rows. And so the black Okies were literally in fields working alongside the machine that would eventually idle them, picking the edges of the cotton. And in 10 years time, they were idled. The women ended up becoming maids and housekeepers for wealthy white farmers, much like the South. Um, and the men, uh, where they could, found work. 
but many of them were idled, and the children left this place. So when we came upon it, it was mostly old folks. Um, when I wrote my last book, West of the West, I came back to find them because I wanted to open up that book with the Black Okies. And every place that I'd gone to a decade earlier, it was empty. They had died, and in some cases, the places were still standing like this place. There's that yellow house just two fields away. This is where we found Minnie Patterson. She had come in the 19, 1945, 46. She was dying. They set up a room for her in the front where she could see this grapevine that her husband had planted when they arrived here in California. She said that she'd come to this patch of brown surrounded by a sea of white cotton in the fall of 1945. She decided that first night she wouldn't be staying. What kind of land have you brought me to? She asked her husband. Driving three miles to fetch water, reading scripture by kerosene lamp. You might as well have kept me hitched to the plantations of East Texas. She wanted a home, nothing fancy in the civilized city. A tract house up the road in Fresno or Bakersfield would do. But Willie Patterson, her husband, kept pounding nails and boards onto that crooked hut in the middle of horn toad country. And the black people kept trickling in from Oklahoma and Arkansas and Texas and Louisiana. They'd come looking for a place where the cotton grew a little taller and the white folks had been raised up a little nicer. They found the taller cotton. I'm not sure they found the white folks any nicer. The Black Okies thought coming west that they would leave behind the racism. The sun did shine a little bit more benignly on them here, but I remember a number of them telling me that it was even um, a more cruel kind of racism. A smile on the face, but a dagger behind the back is how they described California. They um, were not allowed to live in any of the cities, not even the small towns, they were locked out. And so the only land that was available to them were these patches of alkali land. Literally, when you ride up on the land and you look at it, it looks like it's so salty, it looks as if it's snowed there. And this is the land that was available to them. And they built their little wooden shacks here. No water, they had to go into town to fetch the water. Uh, no city sewers, they had outhouses. Uh, no police roamed this area. It was a no man's land basically these glorified kind of squatters villages. I mean, this is a place that got bypassed by the civil rights movement, by the war on poverty. None of it ever came here. And so, um, you know, it was, a, it was a tough life. One of the things Dixon told us before he died, he was stuffing actually cardboard boxes into the plywood of that house to keep it insulated. And he looked up, I remember, and he said, I worked all my days in the cotton field and on the railroad. I wasn't lazy. What happened to my life? We're standing in some of the poorest places in America right now. Um, you'd have to go to the borderlands of Texas or Appalachia to find poverty that we have here. And, and that really is a function of the kind of agriculture we have. I mean, we have big industrial agriculture that concentrates wealth in a few hands and that de depends on a constant supply of cheap labor. And for most of the century that cheap labor has come from south of the border. And farmers here are reaching deeper and deeper into the rural peasant heart of Mexico to bring out the labor. But there have been problems with that flow now and again. And that's why the farmers have reached to other people. Sikhs came here to pick. Armenians came here to pick, Chinese, Japanese, um, Hmong, although the Hmong are more of small farmers. And then the Black Okies at some point, and the White Okies were brought from the South and Southwest to come here and pick the crops. Um, some of them moved up the economic ladder, became tractor drivers, truck drivers, business owners. Um, that's happened with the White Okies. It happened with Latinos, some of them. Uh, the Black Okies, though, had to leave this place to find economic prosperity. And the, the, the original 
family members who came here, the, the old folks remain, stayed behind. They never, they never acquired much. I think theirs is the saddest story of all those groups. And, um, and they stayed behind here simply because they love the rural lifestyle. We went by Martha Williams' house today. It's no longer there. But she was an 86-year-old widow of an Arkansas sharecropper, and she was living with her son in a sagging house. Don't feel sorry for me, Williams said. This is a shack, but it's my shack. God gave it to me. I ain't got nobody coming to me saying you owe me rent. I sleep as I as long as I want to and get up when I'm ready and when the beautiful wind gets to blowing I can flap my wings when I want to flap them. I sleep easy at night right here in my little rundown shack by the highway. It may not be your dream but it's mine. Now you can just turn around and leave us alone. <laughs>